Hey there, Greg. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, Glenn. How are you? I am doing excellent. I'm well, not exactly, and we could yeah. talk about it. I mean, there's some struggles and some challenges, but I am Glenn Lowry, and this is the Glenn Show. Uh, we're at Substack.com, and we're at YouTube, and we are also at BloggingHeads.tv. Let me not forget them, Bob Wright, who gave me my start in the podcasting business. Uh, this is the Glenn Show, Glenn Lowry Brown University. Um, ordinarily, every other week, I'm here with John McWhorter, my conversation partner, but we weren't able to get our schedules coordinated this week, so we're skipping a John episode, and in John's place, we have Greg Thomas. Greg is a musician and a writer about jazz and uh, a, a very reflective and interesting fellow. We have some friends in common. Greg, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit more effectively than, than I'm doing right now? Uh, tell people who you are and uh, you know how we come to be talking to each other today. Okay, be glad to. I just got to say, now that's some big shoes to fill. You talking about I'm replacing <laughs> John McBoy? That's, that's you know I, that ain't even right to draw the throw on the brother. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry. I should have warned you about I that. Know, thing, right? But that's all. It's all good. It's all okay, good. good. Yeah. Well, we're the black we're the black guys at blogging hits. You know, that's what John and I call ourselves. Exactly. So we're still the black guys. You know. <laughs> that's right. Well, let's see. I am um, the head of the Jazz Leadership Project CEO. My my partner and wife Jewel is the COO. Uh, of that um, of this enterprise, uh, which is about six seven years old, and we are doing quite well even through the pandemic. You know, we got a great client base, which we can talk about. But jazz is kind of a mainstay in, in my life, from falling in love with the music in high school to minoring in music in college at Hamilton College, uh, <laughs> to becoming a writer about the music. Um, starting in the mid nineties at the city sun where I wrote about other things too, on up to being New York daily news, jazz columnist from 2011 to 2013. And, uh, so that's a good capsule. I mean, there's a lot more to tell, but we got a lot to discuss. So jazz is your life, huh? Yes, sir. Jazz leadership project. I'm sorry. Yes. Jazz leadership project. So what, what, what's that about, the connection of jazz and leadership? Well, what we do is we focus on leadership development and team success. So we do workshops in person and online where we use the principles and practices of the music and use it as a model for developing leaders in organizations and making teams stronger. And we found that there is a, incredible bridge between the skills and capacities that you see in great jazz, great jazz ensembles and great jazz musicians that apply directly to the way people do what they do individually, but, but collectively on teams. And so, I mean, we've been, we've been fortunate. I mean, we've got as clients, Verizon, JP Morgan, Chase, TD Bank, Con Edison, uh, wow. Center for Policing Equity, NYPD. I mean, wow. we we and and we're about six seven years old. So, you know, we uh we we we're, we're we're pleased at our progress. What is excuse my naivete the uh, characteristics of jazz as a musical form distinct from popular genres or classical European music or whatever? that lends itself to uh, leadership training and uh, whatnot. What, what is it about jazz in particular that's connected up with leadership? Okay, great question. Um, well, we have four principles and six practices. So let's just very quickly talk about the principle. The very first principle is individual excellence. To play jazz, you gotta have your chops together. You've gotta, you gotta know how to play your instrument well, and and if your instrument could be a um, musical instrument like a trumpet, saxophone, trombone, guitar, piano, bass, drums, or your voice. But also, there's the imperative of improvising in jazz. So it's not just being. It's not just like in most European classical music and concert music, chamber music. You're reading a score. Well, the score in jazz, you know, is a basic, you know, melody, a chart uh, with harmonies and such. 
And you've got to be able to improvise on those melodic and harmonic melodic themes and harmonic chord structures and such in a way that you're telling a coherent story. So individual excellence first, then there's antagonistic cooperation, which is an orientation and perspective on confronting challenge, conflict and competition. So antagonistic cooperation comes from the hero's journey. So instead of looking at challenges as something that you should cower from, it's like, this is something you can grow and learn from. And that's present in the music all the time, because I mean, there's many great stories of you know, cutting contests where musicians are going head to head and making each other play better and better. Uh, then there's shared leadership. The first two are individual. Then there's shared leadership, which is more of a ensemble or group or team dynamic where we respect the individual capacity of each person to be a leader in his or her own right. And with that respect, there's not only shared respect, there's shared responsibility and accountability to the team. And then lastly, there's ensemble mindset, which is our highest principle, which is uh, like a collective orientation to co-creating together through what we call collective intelligence. And of course, in jazz, the practice of swinging is, is, is represented by that when that's happening on a very high level. Wow. Wow. Individual mastery, what, what do you call it? The uh, antagonistic cooperation or something like that? Yes, sir. Oh, man. That's all uh, there in music. leadership and, and ensemble, okay. Do you bring music into the um, into the seminar room? And, I'm, I'm uh, glad to say these? it's not just verbal theory. They got to hear the music. So in our <laughs> in our in person workshops, we we have a, a live band. We have a JLP Jazz Leadership Project band that plays, and when it's virtual, we play recorded music. So absolutely, it's because the music kind of cuts through. The just the cognitive intellectual, you can feel it. So when we talk about a particular principle or practice, you play an example and you say, this is what this is. Then people can, oh, I feel that. And then we bridge it to the workplace. I see. Now, how do you know, other than the growing client base, that this uh, very interesting sounding uh, uh, format and, and template is effective. How do, how do you know that people are better leaders after going through your, your uh, program? That's a good question. Well, one way is they actually start to use the lingo in meetings. So you know you're getting through. So um, when we did our workshop with Verizon a few years ago, our first workshop, we actually have another workshop, a virtual one coming up in a couple of days. Um, we heard from our advocate there, David Hubbard, who is the deputy general counsel for the consumer legal uh, group. He said we were having a meeting and someone said, you know, what we need is to, you know, have more awareness of, of syncopation, being ready for the unexpected. And then we need to have more of an attitude of antagonistic cooperation, not looking at it as negatives, but this is a way we can grow and learn. I mean, so that's one, one measure. And what we're doing now is we're going from like one-off workshops to a longer term six to 12 month series of engagements where you could truly measure your impact and how much you're impacting the culture. Of, a, of, of teams and organizations. So we're moving in the direction. So we'll be able to do more measurement, but we do have some, we have some, um, we have da some data driven and quantitative aspects too. We have two assessments that we use before we do the engagement. Um, one is called a pos position success indicator. It's 10 to 12 minute um, assessment that takes a look at how individuals like to work together. What's their particular style? You know, are they more um, on the um, lead instrument tip where they're discovery and improvisation, or, or are they more like a piano that's dealing with design and integrating 
different parts of the ensemble, or are they more like a bassist, which is making sure to keep a certain quality control through the consistency of that line? Or is it more like a drummer? more operations oriented, keeping the beat, keeping the groove, you know, keeping time as we say in the music. So, I mean, we always connect it to the music, but we have some, some measures that we can get before and then we can do that again afterwards. The second one, just to mention quickly, is a cultural values assessment based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So it takes a look at what is the value composition of the organization or the team um, and what their current state is and what their desired state is where they want to move towards. And it's all captured there. So we do that beforehand to get a, an idea of some metrics that you can base some curation of the actual work together and also give some real powerful insights to the organizations we work with. This is fascinating. I mean, do you find that in effective teams, there are individuals who are playing these various musical ensemble roles? You know, somebody's keeping time, you know, somebody is laying down the baseline, you know, uh, that, that there are these kinds of back and forth between the virtuosity of a team member who has mastery over this kind of specialized activity Absolutely. and over that kind of specialized activity. Absolutely. And, and what I laid out for you verbally, we actually put on a four quadrant matrix. So we actually show them once they take, the, we show them where they are on the matrix and we have the overlay of the function of the role and the musical instrument. So they can walk away and say, oh, wow, I'm like a bassist. So I'm like a, and then you see in their particular quadrant, how close they are to the middle or how far out they are in that quadrant. If they're far out, the qualities of that quadrant, quadrant are very, very strong. If they're closer to the middle, they're strong, but they are closer to some of the other functions. And that tells a story, you know? So so it's, it's, it's fun, it's a lot of fun. Man. Okay, now I gotta ask you this, cause we're the black guys here. <laughs> Jazz is African-American music, at least in its origins. Yes. Uh, and here we are in the 21st century, and of course the world's become a small place, and, and jazz has become an art form that has transcended its origins to some degree. D does the blackness, quote unquote, and correct me if this is the wrong way of putting it, uh, of, the, of this musical form color in any way uh, how you're operating in these big corporations, which are, you know, got, they got all kinds of different dynamics going on in them and they they got Robin D'Angelo like consultants <laughs> coming in to help them get their implicit bias uh, <laughs> straight out and whatnot. Uh, what, what, what's it like bringing this African-American musical form into into corporate America and, and how does it relate to, you know, racial identity issues and stuff like that? Good question. We, um, I mean, my my wife and I are both, I'm a black American. She is from Barbados originally. So she is a Caribbean American. And so that's obvious. I mean, that we embody that. The musicians yeah. we use are black American primarily. So one, they can see that. And the art form, as you say, has its origins and is innovated mainly and primarily by, by black folk, by black Americans. Um, we are now developing a model that we're calling diversity, maturity, and inclusion, which is a developmental way of looking at diversity and inclusion, where you start at the bottom of a triangle and at the bottom you have like identity, affirmative action, that type of thing. But that's not the highest level. That's, that can be an entry point. But there's so many levels above that in terms of what diversity and inclusion could mean, could and should mean. So after you do you know, that basic level, because you could have, as they say, black faces in, in high places. But what does that mean? You know, and if if there's a not not more going along than just this outer skin tone, then you have appreciating difference. 
I mean, that's a fundamental thing just to appreciate because difference itself brings, you know, tension. Like in music, there's tension and release. So it brings tension. So there needs to be a, an appreciation for, for, for difference. Then there has to be a managing of some of the tensions at, that come from diversity because it's not the smooth sailing, obviously. But the highest level is leveraging diversity where you are using the differences and all of those qualities from the bottom to leverage diversity and inclusion for the betterment of your team and organization. So we're specifically developing that because of, let us say, the gaps in, in what's being primarily presented in, in corporation these days where we know that a lot of it not only doesn't work, but in some cases makes things worse. Yeah. Yeah. All right. George Clinton. <laughs> the no, funk, man, I did the, a little the funk, bit of the research. The funkmeister. Yeah, funk, yeah, yeah. T talk about George Clinton for a minute, because you did some funkadelic kind of stuff, didn't you? Well, not so much. I mean, what I would say is, see, uh, between Funkadelic and Earth, Wind & Fire, I'm an Earth, Wind & Fire man. I, Funkadelic is cool. Earth, okay. Wind & Fire, that's my groove. Okay, so okay. I would prefer to talk about Earth, Wind & Fire, you know. Well, but, well, well, uh, yeah. but, but the thing is, you know, something what's interesting about even those two is that they represent kind of two approaches to funk, R&B, soul, you know, in the 70s. And one is more of a, a, of a loose knit, you know, uh, a, approach to it. Whereas Earth, Wind & Fire was highly organized, you know, and structured in what they did. They had clear jazz influences and, and yeah. their harmonies. I just, man, don't get me started talking about about Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds good. So we got some uh, some friends in in common. Yes, uh, we do. I learned, yeah. you know, the late Stanley Crouch, for example. Uh, he's much missed. Absolutely. Uh, did you all work together there in New York City, talking about writing about jazz? Uh, not directly, but I mean, I, I got to know Stanley in the nineties. Um. I mean, that's when tell I got people, my start. Excuse me, excuse me, Greg. Tell people a little bit about who Stanley oh, Crouch was. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Wow. Notes of a Hanging Judge is his first yeah. book. Um, he, from the 60s, I mean, he was a poet and a follower uh, uh, in many ways of Amiri Baraka. Um, and go through the 70s where he met Albert Murray and Ralph Ellison, who helped turn him around from um, more of a, a kind of a radical uh, black arts movement kind of orientation. And so by the late seventies, he's writing for the Village Voice and he's writing about jazz and all kind of stuff. And by 89, Notes of a Hanging Judge comes out, he wins a MacArthur, he, he publishes a series of his essays a few years later, um, uh, The All-American Skin Game or The Decoy yeah. of Race, um, Always <laughs> in Pursuit, you know, a book that he worked on for 25 years, you know, um, uh, biography of Charlie Parker. I mean... So he's a great writer, a stylist. There's a novel in there, Don't the Moon Look Lonesome? Oh, Don't the Moon Look Lonesome? Don't let me forget. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So this great was an African-American uh, man of letters, yes. uh, a contemporary of mine, uh, a, an iconoclast. I mean, I remember when I started the Institute on Race and Social Division at Boston University in like 96, 97, I get a call from Stan. Yo, man. Don't you know race is over? <laughs> <laughs> what you doing starting a race institute, bro? Race is over, man. <laughs> I mean, I, I, and he would all say, man, don't you know about, that's, some, that's about some bullshit, man. That's about some bullshit, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny. We talked about, this would be probably in the early 2000s, maybe doing a blog together. 
and uh, it, it didn't end up happening. But yeah, I told him that I was doing a lot of study on race and how do we transcend race. And he didn't, you know, it was like, it was almost like Stanley was so interested in the deeper issues of life, of society, of the United States, of the world, and making sure that we were clear on our heritage as Americans and as Westerners. He yeah. that he didn't have time to, whereas I, I kind of felt that I needed to delve a little more deeply into it to more directly confront, you know, race as a as a topic, race as an issue. Um, but I think more importantly, he was about similar to you. He wanted us to us being black Americans, be cognizant of not only your the legacy of enslavement, not only the, the legacy of oppression and degradation, there's a legacy of greatness, of a deep, profound achievement in the face of unbelievable odds. And that was more his focus. That was Ellison's focus. That was Murray's focus. And they were very, they were also, they were like you say, man of letters, literary men. They came out of the humanities primarily. Yeah. And that's important to mention too. Yeah. What do you think is left of that great legacy? Um, uh, Ralph Ellison, uh, Albert Murray, I'm the Americans. We're talking here about Stanley Crouch. All of these men are gone. We have their books. But has not the conversation about race, especially amongst African Americans, been seized by people who are not all that friendly to the to the worldview uh, of these uh, embrace those these who would want to embrace our American heritage, who would want to focus on what has been created culturally, politically, and so on here by African descended people here in America. Uh, involved in the larger project of the making of American civilization, involved at its foundations. Um, I, I guess I'm trying to ask a question here, but I don't know exactly what it is. I'm, I'm saying 50 years from now, are people going to know who Albert Murray was? Well, if I have anything Stanley to say Crouch about was? it, they will. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the reason I say that is because not just in terms of me being a writer also, um, I am part of a, of a movement um, and a collaboration um, called Combating Racism and Anti-Semitism Together, Shaping an Omni-American Future. And we had in October of 2021, uh, you know, two day broadcast um, where we had, we gave Wynton Marsalis an honor we had Bob O'Mealy and Farrah Jasmine Griffin from Columbia. We had various scholars, Jewish and, and Black American, um, to talk about the legacy of Murray. And this is going to be an annual event. So definitely, uh, if I have anything to do with it and say about it, it will continue. But to answer the, the implied question that you had is, like, what, what happened to that legacy? Yeah. And... The answer is deep and complex, but I'll just try to bullet point it by saying, I think what happened in the starting in the 60s, kind of similar to what John, John McWhorter points out, it was in the 60s that there was a shift. So you had, you know, you have Dr. King, civil rights movement, but then you have a more radicalized version, um, not only black arts movement, but, you know, Black nationalism, you know, uh, Stokely Carmichael um, taking over SNCC from, um, oh, Jim, what's, what's the, the great? Um, yeah. Who was, uh, it was, was it Foreman? No, no, no. This was, this was, um, um, oh, good Lord. He died like two years ago. John Lewis. John Lewis. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah John he took Lewis. it over from John Lewis. So he had a shift there. And Stanley talks about this a lot. But to, to fast forward, that's where some things began to go off, go off kilter. That's in that's intra black American political development. 
But larger, a larger perspective is in the 60s, you mentioned worldview, Glenn. Another worldview came online, I think in the 60s, a postmodern worldview. So, uh, I mean, when you talk about the legacy of the enlightenment, when you talk about the legacy of liberal democracy, um, a secular orientation as opposed to a religious orientation, which would be traditional. You know, you're talking about modernity, but post-modernity came online in the sixties and, and developed, particularly in French thought with folks like Derrida and Foucault and others, where the focus was a critique of the power relations or the, the, the power dimensions of life so that those who were not a part or left out of some of the fruits of modernity uh, were like, you know, how, how do they do this? So they analyzed, how do you keep, get, keep and maintain power, whether it's colonial power, and then they critique it even down to the language that's used, they deconstruct it, and this is this is what we see when you're talking about Ibram X Kendi. When you're talking about a whole orientation, particularly on the left, progressive left, that's a large part of it. So understanding this particular worldview is really important because once you understand it as a worldview, then you can say, okay, this is where they're coming from. They're in the same way that modernity was based on the foundation of traditionalism, there were certain core values, you know, family, um, duty, honor, that comes from traditionalism. Modernity, you know, is founded on that, but modernity pushed it up against the whole religious orientation. Postmodernism pushes up against modernity. So each level is pushing up against the other and critiquing the other, but they're grounded on the basis of the other, without, without we, us being weird, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, postmodernism wouldn't even have a basis upon which to stand. The reason they can critique is because they can point out the contradictions in how the social contract in America, for example, was employed, but they're not pointing out the fact that we are moving closer and closer, we got a ways to go, but it's moving in a certain direction. There's so many things that they miss and leave out because they're about deconstructing and critiquing. And what, when are we gonna get to some reconstruction? When are we gonna get to some synthesis? You know, it's, it's got, something's gotta integrate these, these different uh, worldviews. And that's, I'm also a part of that work uh, through an organization called the Institute for Cultural Evolution. Okay, I want to hear about the Institute for Cultural Evolution, but I first want to understand the connections between the development of political and cultural thinking amongst African Americans on the one hand, and the advent of this large scale movement in intellectual life that you're calling postmodernism on the other. It's not obvious to me that the that the the one should be the latter should be driving the former, should have as much influence over the former as it does have. Um, I'm wondering, for example, about what happened to the church. Mm -hmm. the, I'm talking about the black church, right. which, which has has a role in music, of course. Uh, it, it's a foundational uh, institution in the development of black American experience on the North American continent since the days, the dark days of enslavement. Um, it has been a way of looking at and interpreting experience that has given comfort and, and lent support and structure uh, to the enslaved people, our enslaved people and um, our, our uh, and their descendants. Uh, and it's as far from postmodernism as you could possibly get, it would appear to me. Yeah. I mean, people love their Jesus. They believe in, sure. in their Bible. They, they're trying to, to live right and righteously in, in the sight of God and so forth and so on. Uh, that's not dead yet uh, in Black American culture. Uh, why should it lose out to the postmodernist tendency? I mean, are, are we leaving something out? Is it not just Black folks that we're talking about here? Oh, yes. Is we're it, not just talking about know, Black folks. 
Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I mean, what you're talking about is 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 the beautiful foundation of, of of traditional. That's the traditional I was referring to. Absolutely. And that has been a source of the development of a leadership class. That's been the place where we were able to build communal institutions. That's the place where on Sunday mornings, we were able to sing a joyful noise into the Lord, yeah. you know, whereas Saturday night, what Albert Murray called the Saturday night function, that was the blues, you know, the blues idiom. But Sunday morning was more about, you know, the sacred and the devotional. So you're right. That is still there. And the, and the key thing is <clears throat> this kind of developmental arc that I alluded to. I think what has happened, it always happens that, you know, in the same way that each generation has to learn certain lessons over and over again, you know, we have to teach our children and then our children have to teach their children. I think that the way it's been, these, these big worldviews, you know, these ways of having certain coherent values across time, the problem has been that you can critique like modernity. You could critique the downsides of the religious worldview and its intersection with politics, which of course, you know, is a big part of moving away from feudalism and such. But you don't, as they say, throw out the baby with the bathwater. Same thing with postmodernism. Yeah, you could critique the downsides of modernity, but good Lord, man, it's not just disasters. There's also dignities in modernity. So I think the answer to your question ultimately is to have a way of looking at the positives, the contributions of each of these levels, these worldview levels, and focusing on that, integrating it, synthesizing it in a way, or at least attempting to, and trying to avoid the downsides because each one has uh, detriments, downsides, shadows, no question. So the question is how can we integrate the best aspects of those so we, won't, we don't lose something essential and end up you know, in the kind of confusion that we're in today? Okay, Institute for Cultural Evolution. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm a senior fellow of the Institute for Cultural Evolution, which is based in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, it was founded by Steve McIntosh, who is uh, a political philosopher, a philosopher, not just of politics, but his last book, um, Developmental Politics. Um, I think, let me see here. Yeah, I think. Just happen to have a copy. I just happen to have a copy right here. <laughs> uh, how America can grow into a better version of itself is his last book. I mean, the Institute is looking at politics through the window of culture in the sense that it's not just a political issue. It's about values. It's about what are the values and virtues we need to cultivate, recognize and cultivate to kind of get out of this mess that we're in, in a very basic way. Now you had a, a guest uh, recently, I watched it yesterday morning, I think it was just released, um, and she mentioned integral theory. I said, oh Yeah, this goodness. is Stephanie Lepp. That's right. Stephanie said, Lepp. Oh, yep. Well, I, I've been a student of integral theory for over 20 years. So I was like, well, that's interesting. Well, oh. the Institute for Cultural Evolution is grounded in large part on integral theory. Um, uh -oh. But the important thing I think to recognize is this, it's, a, it's an attempt to apply a way of seeing the world that is more integrative. You use the word holistic, I think, at the end of your conversation with Stephanie. It is holistic, but it's not just that. It's developmental, which is one of the reasons I'm so happy to speak with you because you mention this often, that we need to look at the development of the capacities, the human capacities of Black Americans, and by extension, all Americans. And we agree, sure. we agree. The question is, how do you enter that conversation and, and where are we going with it? So um, the, thing, the Institute for Cultural Evolution 
believes that through cultural growth, cultural awareness and cultural growth, we can find our way out of this hyperpolarization that we see. We can look at these different, uh, not only worldviews, but we can actually look at the spectrum of the political, um, the political spectrum in a way where you could say that there's a certain amount of population that's traditional, certain amount of population that is modern and modernity, and a certain percentage that's postmodern. And what Steve does in the book is he actually puts the the left, let me see, which on, on the screen, I guess that would be, yeah, the, that would be no here. The left <laughs> here, the right here. And he says, well, on the left, you have progressive postmodernists and liberal postmodernists. On the right, you have fiscally conservative modernists and socially conservative traditionalists. And he looks at the, the value sets of those. Then he takes a look at, say, like gay marriage or the legalization of marijuana and shows how it's through fulfilling the highest values of each of those groups, it became more socially acceptable. So it's not just a theoretical orientation, it's like an application, praxis, an application of a theory to actually try to ameliorate many of our, our political uh, and social problems and social issues. Okay, how would you apply that to Black Lives Matter and uh violence against uh, African-Americans by police and uh, George Floyd's uh, aftermath of his death and uh, riots and civil disorder of uh, 2020 and so on. Yeah, that's a deep one. That's a deep one. Um, it's, so, it's, so, it's, it's very complex for one thing. Let's admit that it's very complex. What it's not is some simplistic look at white supremacy being the reason for all of it. That's this such simplistic, childish, you know, I mean, come on. Um, so I won't try to parse in the, the, the theory and apply it to that. I just want to give you my perspective okay. on some of that, you know, because there's a lot there. I mean, because not all the same, they're related, but they're not all the same. Um, matter of fact, I'll ask you, Give me one to focus on. You mentioned like three. Give me one. <laughs> okay. Uh, Post-George Floyd killing, civil disorder, protests that became violent, uh, and defund the police, and all of that. Yeah. Which a lot of people were uh, moved to get up out of their chairs and go outside yeah. and protest. Right. And a lot of reactionaries were moved to go to the polls and vote for people like Donald Trump and uh, express their uh, rejection right. of that worldview. And the country was and perhaps still is sharply divided uh, around these questions. And it ain't over yet. So. That's right. Well, let me say this. Like, there's a couple of ways to look at Black Lives Matter, for example. Um, um, I think it's Charles Love has a, a, a book that he deeply critiques Black Lives Matter and goes into like their finances and stuff. So yeah. some of the financial irregularities that we see, I mean, frankly, that's yeah. that's like the human condition. You know, that's one of the things that we talked about, you know, there's, there's, the founders knew that part of human nature is the propensity for corruption for being open to all kinds of perfidy. I mean, that's just the human condition. That's not something that's specific to black folk, obviously. So, obviously. you know, and also I want to acknowledge that there were many well-meaning meaning people who wanted to do something after they saw, I mean, my God, the brutal killing of George Floyd. So I think the majority of people had great intentions and wanted to take action. That's why you saw that around the world. Um, I think in terms of the violence, I mean, I'm as critical of the violence and destruction, death and to not only people, but destruction of property as I am about what happened on January 6th. I am not down with what happened on January 6th. I think that was a travesty, yeah. you know, but I also think that the violence that was, I think, 
if not put under the rug, was de-emphasized by the liberal media is also, you know, we cannot justify that. We, we don't need that. I'm not going to, you know, be an apologist for that type of behavior. You know I mean? That's just unacceptable. And we have to find peaceful ways of engaging or protesting and being in civil democratic discourse. That's key because I mean, if you, if you just tearing, excuse my expression, tearing shit down again, that's destruction, deconstruction, but we got to build. There's got to be a way for us to build together. So what, what is the teachings of integral theory that are relevant to moving from a conflict and a division to a kind of civic respect, respectful exchange of views and a constructive uh, engagement? Well, I'm going to use a term that comes outside of integral theory, but I think it applies to it. And it's by philosopher Anthony Appiah. Oh, and yeah, uh, it's an idea that was also taken up by Danielle Allen, who's my favorite political philosopher. You know, I know her too. Oh my God, Steve McIntyre is my favorite non-academic political philosopher, but she's my favorite political philosopher in the academy. And, and the concept is rooted cosmopolitanism. So I mean, take a look at you, for example, Glenn. I mean, you are rooted in a black American tradition, identity, you, you, you identify with it, you, you embody it, but that doesn't limit you to just that. You're also a man of the world and you're not just confined to the discipline of economics. I've heard you talk about Thomas Mann and, and this one and that one. I mean, you are, you are, as they say, a cultured brother, you know? <laughs> So rooted is saying that you can have, this is my interpretation, that you could have certain identities all the way from, you know, in indigenous to traditional to modern to postmodern. You can have all of those identities. You could have ethnic, gender, cultural, all of that, nationality. These are different forms of identity. All that's good. And these are rooted. You could say you're rooted in those. But the cosmopolitan is, as, as you know, being a citizen of the world. That's being world-centric. So integral theory it provides, for me at least, a way to be rooted in certain identities, but not confined just to those identities, to have a larger sphere of care and concern so that it's about being both local and concerned with what's happening in my community as well as what's going on in the world itself overall. I think, so that's, that's a general way of putting it that I think is uh, people can understand. And I, I, I just love that concept, rooted cosmopolitanism. So I think that's one way of putting it. What do you say to, I can imagine a critic uh, saying, well, that's easy for uh, people to say if they sit pretty much in positions of power and uh, so on, but okay, black people need to be both black and cosmopolitan. What what do white people need to do? Well, do do you see what I'm getting at? I, I um, I mean, no, some people can take their position for granted as part of the dominant oh culture, right? Uh, others have to find a way of making their peace with without abandoning their their uh, uh, origins or their identity. They have to find a way of making peace with, you know, w with uh, the world. Uh, they, they have to grow. Right. Well, that's interesting. You know, um, white folks, whiteness. Uh, yeah. That's a big topic. Uh, I think, generally speaking, it applies across groups, categories, and identities, that perspective. So it's not obviously just for black folks, integral theory, you know, I'm like a unicorn up in there, man. It's not a lot of me, not a lot, not, not a lot of us is up in there uh, <laughs> at this point. But I think one of the things, one of the tragedies, frankly, of, of whiteness in the United States is kind of a Faustian bargain 
Like if you look at the histories of Irish, Italian, yeah. Polish, and others, Jewish? it was almost as if they, you know, they said, first of all, you know, we know the original white folks. And, and you know that within and among black folks, we joke about this. And at least we know that our ancestors, that our parents, grandparents, is like, you know, the real white folks are white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Everybody else, the mm -hmm. white ethnics ain't really white, but, uh, <laughs> <you know? laughs> but the Faustian bargain, it seems to me, was it was almost as if it was, look, if you're willing to become white and kind of bleach out your ethnicity, you can come in the club and get the benefits and privileges, you know, but just leave that, uh, you know, leave that, that, that primitive ethnocentric stuff. Now, of course, there are people who still hold on to their ethnic identity, obviously. But I think that, I think more white folks need to become rooted cosmopolitans. I think more white folks need to be uh, aware of their I various identities, right? Not just racial, because white, the way whiteness is function, you know this, the way whiteness is function is that they didn't have to really think about being white because that was the default. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that was the default. So, you know, uh, Resma Menachem, who wrote a wonderful book called My Grandmother's Hands, he, he called this, he, see, I, I love it when people, uh, I'm going to use a term that comes from the academy. I'm not in the academy, but I did four years of graduate work at NYU in American Studies, which is why I know the whole postmodern thing deeply from the literature itself. So, uh, I like it when people interrogate or complicate certain terms. So he says white body, so he doesn't just say white supremacy, he says white body supremacy. The way that white folks looked were the model, okay? Um, Albert Murray would say the folklore of white supremacy. So he termed it in terms of where, where, what it is and where it came from. But right. Resmaa Menachem, um, well, anyway, let, let, me, let me get back to the main point. So as the default, they didn't have to think about whiteness per se as an identity, but I think it's important not per se to, because honestly, I'm like, I'm like Stanley. I think race is a bullshit category. I think that the process of racialization, which is how race becomes racism, you have a racial worldview, like a way of seeing the world through race, and then you have racialization where you have, you know, you select certain characteristics and then you sort into different populations and you give attributions of certain qualities based on those that sorting. Then you yes. essentialize as if those differences are, are biological and immutable. And then there's yeah. action and behavior that is based on that process of racialization. I think all of that is some bullshit, okay? But there are aspects of identity that are, that are fine. Ethnicity, nationality, um, gender. And I know that all of these are complicated issues. The way postmodernism handles all these issues, it calls everything into question but race. It reifies and reinforces race for some strange reason. But my point is that I think more Americans overall, I mean, Albert Murray, man, Albert Murray said, listen, our inheritance as Americans is the cultural and intellectual riches of mankind across time. There's no limitation. Andre Malraux had that. a concept called Museum Without Walls. Man, we have access to everything. I heard that. You know, so we need to like get with it. And when you look at it, man, it's not just about the United States. I mean, we could talk about disparity and they're there, no question. But one of the things I wonder is why is the United States on the OECD uh, list of countries, 38 countries, why is the United States, States 28th in terms of STEM education? Why is there a US News and World Report 
study that says that the United States is 26 in quality of life. What's up with that? So it's not just about black folks trying to get up to the level of white folks. No, we're in a global economy and we need to like think globally, world centric. And as you said on the show, what do you say? China is coming. Yeah. That's real, you know? So we need to, we need to, all of us need to be rooted. That's good. But expand our care and concern that it goes from individual to family to community, however you conceive the community, to the world. I think that progression is something we all need to tap into. Greg, when we uh, were chatting before we started uh, recording, you mentioned your daughter and you said you wanted to speak about her. You haven't had a chance to do that. Why don't we close with that? Man, you're going to get me, you start me to crying up in here, man, talking about my oh. baby. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so my daughter, Kaya Thomas Wilson, um, that's her married name, Wilson. Well, she is a 27-year-old superstar. She is, she graduated from Dartmouth. That's where I met our mutual friend, Stefan, Stefan Alexander. Yeah. And she went on to work in Silicon Valley. When she was in college, she actually created an app called We Read 2. Because when she was growing up, man, man, just like me, but even beyond me, she was a voracious reader, man. We would get together. I would go to Barnes and Noble and just let her just run around. And, and, and so she just caught the fire of reading and just room. She would just not just read books. She would read series of books. You know, I mean, you know, it was just incredible. So Dartmouth, went on from Dartmouth, uh, had We Read 2 app, which has been featured in the App Store several times. And she... It's, a, it's an app that features books written by people of color that has characters of color in them. Because when she was growing up and doing all that reading, she didn't see enough of that. So she's like, I want to create something that features those kind of books. And it got her a lot of acclaim. And she's spoken around the world in different lectures. She's writing. She worked for Slack, then Calm. And now she's at your alma mater. She's actually in a dual MBA engineering program at MIT. So Kaya Thomas Wilson, she's, uh, she's someone who I think is going to help us get to that future. We, we so, we so desire, man. So thank you so much for letting me speak about my baby. Uh, well, as a proud father of five myself, I can understand the, the uh, joy that a parent, a father can take in watching the maturation and, uh, you know, development of his child. Um, so, uh, very good to talk with you, Greg. Maybe we can have another conversation before too long. I sure hope so, man. You know, but that, don't put me in the, don't put me in the have to fill John's shoes. You know what I mean? Don't do that to me. Well, you know, John is an amateur musician and a critic ah. of uh, music himself, of Broadway theater and true. so forth. That's true. Maybe you could come on with the two of us and uh, we can do a three-way. That's the ticket. That's the ticket. We'd love to do it. All right, Greg. Jazz Leadership Project and Institute for Cultural Evolution Fellow. Uh, and uh, delighted that you were able to give us some time uh, today to have a discussion at the Glenn Show. Really appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much for having me on, man. Appreciate it.